Hello, adventuresses, and welcome to the podcast show for women who love horses, travel, and adventure. And today is a super exciting episode. I know I say that, but I just have so many super exciting people on the show. So today is Ashley, and she's from America, and what she did is pretty darn cool. She and her boyfriend decided they're bicycling across Europe, and they decided when they got to Albania, of all places, they would buy some horses and basically ride across Albania. And you know what? That's exactly what they did. And so she shares with us, you know, how she found these horses to buy, you know, the the first stages, how they made their route. She shares a whole lot of really interesting tips and stories, and it was a lot of fun talking with Ashley. So be sure to stick around and listen up. Before we get started, I just wanted to cover one announcement, and that is basically... We have jewelry! Ha ha! So if you have seen our website, seen our podcast, you've seen our logo, uh, it's a girl galloping around the world on horseback, and we've now turned this into a jewelry piece. Um, I actually, I've been wanting to do this for a while, and you know, now, now it's actually happened. So we have bracelets, we have necklaces, and they are available on our website, equestrianadventuresses.com. So please go and check it out. Of course, some of the money which is raised is going to be going into our Equestrian Adventuresses fund. And what we want to do with this fund is, so basically, I mean, you know, when I travel, I sometimes meet people, individuals, or maybe even horses, and how great would that be if they needed some money for their business or their project or to rescue a horse or whatever? How awesome would that be if I could just pull out some money and say, here, it's it's taken care of, you know? So that is the goal behind the Adventuresses Fund. We want to get some money into our fund so that way when we meet these cool ladies, we can do that. We can pay for their coaching course. We can pay for their, you know, whatever it is that they need, their school books so that they can go to school and get an education. So that is the goal. And of course, a percentage will of everything that we're making with Equestrian Adventures will be going to this fund. So thank you very much for checking out our, our jewelry collection. And hit it! We are explorers. We are trailblazers. We love to do what cannot be done. We love to test our limits, cross borders, and we love the freedom horses bring us. We seek lands without fences. Who are we? We are equestrian adventuresses. We are a community of women who love horses, travel, and adventure. To infinity and beyond! And now your host, Crystal Kelly! Hello, adventuresses, and I am here talking to Ashley. She's actually American like me, and her and her boyfriend, Quentin, they just came back from this amazing adventure three months in Albania, uh, where they bought their own horses, and yeah, so I'm super excited to talk to you today, Ashley. Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to to get to share this adventure uh, <laughs> with you guys. Yeah, so you and I had been in touch a little bit, you know, before you even got your horses. Um, so, you know, I, I knew from day one that, you know, we had to have this this conversation. Um, but before I go into, you know, this awesome adventure that you just got back from, I, I want to hear a little bit about your, you know, your story. You know, you're American, your boyfriend is uh, from France, and you've been cycling, I think you said before. And, you know, so what... what um, how did you first start your travels and, you know, with horses? Were you traveling with horses before this adventure? How did you begin this traveling experience? Uh, yeah, that's a, a big question, I guess. Um, so I guess I should start with how I got to France, which is pretty simple. I I grew up riding horses. My mother had a small uh, eventing farm in South Alabama. Um, and so she was my trainer, but as a teenager, uh, kind of hard to have your mom as a trainer if you have a little bit of a rebellious side <laughs> so, so she sent me to a trainer in Florida where I would spend my summers and he was French and he uh, strongly encouraged me to study abroad and ride horses abroad uh, during my university years thinking I think that I would come back but I just never came back so I settled in France after my master's um, and I actually met my boyfriend at the same startup in Paris which was horsey oriented though he had never ridden and uh second round of funding came along and we we didn't make funding and since uh we both really wanted to travel and see the world uh, in an ecologically friendly manner we decided to to head towards asia 
Uh, and so we knew we wanted to do some horse treks, but we also knew it's a bit complicated to ride your horses from France to, to Indonesia, for example. No one's done that. It's super hard with borders. We said, okay, we'll, we'll start slow. We'll do, uh, we'll do a trek in Albania and we'll do a trek in Central Asia and uh, the rest of the time we'll cycle. And, uh, yeah, so we spent a few months preparing it. It takes a long time logistically to think about what you need if you're living out of a bicycle. Uh, and, and then in January, we left. And, <laughs> and so your boyfriend, as you said, he's not horsey, but then sort of pre, I don't know, adventure, you convinced him to do a horsey thing with you in a couple of spots. How, how did that yeah. conversation go? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, he was always... The, the startup we worked in was... Uh, about teaching people how to train with music with their horses so there was a lot of pedagogy which i think is an english word a lot of theory involved so actually he knew a lot about horses and about riding before he even sat on a horse which was eventually super annoying uh because he would say you know he knew but he didn't know um but he was really super willing to do it he uh, immediately was the one who who suggested we do a long trek in central asia and then it was me saying well we need to do a small test trek because neither of us have ever traveled with horses i mean uh it's not i don't know it just had never happened <laughs> yet i guess for me so this was our first trek and uh we did a few woofing which is like where you volunteer on organic farms uh, on our way to Albania, we stopped for a few weeks uh, in Sicily, well, in Corsica and in Sicily, and he was able to ride every day. Uh, and then, yeah, trekking, you don't really have to have a super high level. You just have to be attentive. So, so was he taking some lessons from you or did you guys do some preparation as far as, you know, horses prior to heading off that way? Or did you just, you know, take your bicycles and say, ah, we'll figure it out when we get there? Um, I mean, there was definitely preparation that the, the woofings we did, we were in Corsica for three weeks. So he got to ride every day with me uh, with the watchful eye, you know, put your heels down, put your hands down, open up your shoulders. Uh, so, so but, you did what you what you didn't like with your mom, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and how did he um, cope with lessons from, from his girlfriend? <laughs> oh no, he was fine. I mean, he's pretty game. Like the first time we, we, went off cantering down a trail. We were with a friend and she was like, is he going to be okay? I was like, do you remember how to do two point? He was like, yeah. I was like, okay, we'll just grab Maine. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he's really, really attentive. Uh, once I explained, you know, if you're rough with your hands, that hurts the horse's mouth. So immediately that was resolved. He's really soft with it. You know, he puts his hands down or if he feels nervous, he grabs some mane. Hmm. Uh, no, he was super, super receptive. And all that time we did uh, also gave him a good, base to be around the horses because that's what people I think struggle with is they don't understand the horse's body language at first so they're intimidated yep definitely so, so. a man who listens to instructions <laughs> and he now rides horses great he sounds like a keeper yeah I guess so super lucky. so how did your uh what did your parents think when you said I'm gonna start cycling towards Indonesia from France um they were like, okay, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you in a week, probably. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they're still in the U.S., so when I go do stuff that's maybe a bit off the wall, they're like, all right, have fun, call us, you know, on the weekends when you can. And they love the photos and they love hearing the stories. <laughs> so they're great. pretty supportive. That's great. So you start cycling, and you know, again, a little bit before we get to Albania. Did you, what sort of route were you taking towards Albania? Was there any highlights? Um, well, we left, we left on the 7th of January, so it was pretty cold. Uh, and we were, I mean, we're in, we're in good shape. We go running, we do yoga, but we weren't in shape. We were not in shape to go. Like nobody realizes that Corsica is full of mountains. Uh, and we were not in shape for that. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so that was, it was a bit of a struggle in the beginning. It was cold. The days were really short. But then when we got to, by the time we were in southern Italy, we went Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, and then into the south of Italy. It, it had kind of started to be nice weather. We really started to find a good rhythm. It, it was beautiful. Big, definitely don't miss Calabria. That area is lovely. So then when you were doing this, were you, um, like you said, you sort of got fit in route, I guess. How many... How many days or weeks do you think it took you to, before you, I don't know, before the cycling got easier? 
before it stopped hurting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think probably because we also we took pauses in in Corsica and and Sicily. I think so. By the time we were in Calabria, we were happy. We were we were okay to go out in the mountains because it's much nicer actually to cycle through the mountains than to stay on the coast where the highways are. Uh, yeah, it, it didn't hurt anymore. So I guess that was March. Okay, so you started in January, and in March it stopped hurting. <laughs> in March it stopped hurting. <laughs> Ooh, that's determination then. Um, yeah. So you you guys make it to Albania, and then this you know idea of of horses comes up. Let let us know what your idea was and what what your plan was when you got to Albania. Um, yeah, so basically we, I had read a book, uh, by a guy named, a British guy named Robin Hanbury Tensian, uh, who trekked through, he wanted to do a, a big Albania cultural ride in 2008, uh, and he did it, uh, but he had, uh, it was a different type of ride than what we wanted. He really, to me, he sold it in the book talking about the beautiful landscape, the welcoming people, because Albania has a really special hospitality culture. I mean, it is very very strong almost like central asia everybody i've talked to has been like albania and and uh, iran it's almost the same level of hospitality um so we were super interested to see the country that way and uh so i sketched a route that was similar to to robin's but a little bit further south um and the whole time we were cycling we were doing uh we were doing preparation i mean as far back as september i got in contact with uh an NGO in the north of Albania um, that is dedicated to protecting the national park up there. I got in contact with some people in the south that I thought could help us to find horses to buy. It's definitely, it took a lot of planning, even from before we we, we got to Albania. And had your planning, um, I don't know, like, did you make some good contacts before? So when you landed in Albania, was it just kind of like, you know, Oh, well, I know exactly where to go and what to do. Or did you arrive and you were a little bit like, oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, there was definitely I'm not the planner, the obsessive planner in this. I shouldn't say obsessive. I'm not the big planner in this relationship. Quentin is. So he was super stressed that I hadn't planned more because uh, I kind of felt like Albanian culture was going to be, you know, get here, ask this person. They'll tell you to go see this person, da, 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 da. Uh, but we went straight to the north to the NGO where we had planned to finish the trek. Uh, and then we settled there for a week, kind of got our bearings and we went down South and from there we started, it was really the horse hunt. So it was just asking around, trying to find horses. Right. Uh, and there's not like a, I don't know, internet, there's hardly any real, not real, any Western horseback riding in Albania. Uh, there's one woman who is doing tours out of Girocaster, uh, with a bunch of agencies and then there's a few people that are doing, you know, day treks with English and Western saddles. But otherwise, there's none of the there's not a tack shop in the whole country. Uh. <laughs> and and so, I mean, you said you were an inventor. So why Western? Oh, we, I just said Western because some people have them. We we ended up with English saddles. OK, so your yeah. original idea was to get a Western saddle. No, no, no. We the whole time was English saddles. Just okay. we saw some people with Western saddles. We considered it was if it fits the horse. I'll you know at this point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so you're in the south and you're trying to find horses. Uh, did you just knock on farmers' doors that had horses in the field? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, no, no, no. We the, that was one of the contacts I made in advance was this this woman who's running a horse tourism uh, operation near Girocaster. Uh, she doesn't actually sell her horses, but she um, she took us to see a guy that showed us two horses, <laughs> two horses that hadn't been out of the stables in six months. So they were pretty much balls of butter. Uh, and then perfect for she, beginners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, and and none of the, the two guys selling the horses. I was like, okay, can you hop on him to let me see him move? And they're like, no, no, you get on him. <laughs> no, no, you get on him. <laughs> Um, but then she did, she sent us to a contact of hers further south who, uh, with his brother, they have kind of a horse trading, shepherding business operation. Uh, and they, we ended up buying all three horses from them. And that was really, she sent us to a really nice, honest guy, um, which was, yeah, super lucky. 
So it took us about a week and a half to decide on horses. But there was a moment we were like, if she can't show us, if she can't help us connect to good horses, what are we going to (laughs) do? So then, you know, what are the Albanian horses like? And what were, what was your criteria for choosing a horse? Um, Well, it, the criteria changed very quickly because I arrived kind of with my Western eyes being like, I want something safe, sound and sane uh, and the right size because the horses there are actually quite small. Um, there's, there's during communism times, horseback riding for fun or just in general was not allowed in. I mean, people would report you, you would get in a lot of trouble because it was seen as a capitalist pastime and therefore not useful to the regime. Um, so there were horses for work and they're quite small. Uh, and Quentin is about six foot one. So, so the biggest criteria was a, a horse big enough for Quentin. And then for me, a horse that would be a good leader. Um, and then a pack horse that wasn't insane. Uh, and did you find what, this? It took, it took a while at first to the, we'll see the, the trader he showed us, uh, he showed me a mare that I fell super in love with on the ground. Um, and he didn't show us one for Quentin, but he showed us another mare that ended up being my mare as a pack horse. And, um, well, eventually he brought, he, his brother brought us down some other horses. The mare I fell in love with had a rearing problem, which I found out shortly after cool. sitting on her. Um, but yes, we, we did find them. It was tricky. It, the test that we did, the saddles that they have there, uh, traditionally are the Samar saddles which is a, a wooden saddle. Uh, it's, it's based off the old Turkish saddle. And it's, it's a wooden saddle with, a, I guess, like a straw padding. And it sits on the shoulders and over the kidneys, basically. Um, honestly, when I first saw it, I was like, this is horrible. I've now spent three months in Albania, and they really don't work the horses that much with them. I think that it's probably okay. But for me, I saw it. I was like, I'm not testing the horse in this. We're riding them bareback. So our trial, our trial with all the horses was this bareback adventure, uh, which was great. I mean, we saw what they could do. We went out with the shepherds. We had horses and cows and sheep and everything running all around us. We took them over bridges and through water. And we get to the end and we're at a cafe and they're like, do you want a beer? So we tie up the horses and, and have a beer and like, so do you like them? And we're like, well. That was more than my sport horse could have done without losing his mind. Right. So, yes, we'll we take them. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah, and, and they don't do vet checks there, so we did our own vet check. Okay. Yeah, it was wild. <laughs> and um, so how big were the horses then? How big did Quentin's horse ended up being? Um, I think he's about 16-1. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, I and mean, that was a bit, every, everywhere we went, people were like, that horse is so big. <laughs> wow. And because I also have heard that the horses in Albania are quite small. Um, they are. They are. So you managed to find find a, a big one. Because I, I actually have the same. My husband who rides, he's also, he's like almost six foot tall. And mm. so he needs he needs a big pony. Um, yeah, so, so you, you buy the horses and you said your mare had a rearing problem. You found that no, out no, no. afterwards or... Yeah, yeah, the one that I didn't take had a, had a oh, very problem. Okay. I ended up with the the horse he showed us first as a pack horse. Her name is Griva, uh, and she ended up being my horse. She's a super, and we took a, a pony as a pack horse because the pony is was. They showed us a few horses that could have been pack horses, but they were all quite young. And Quentin's horse, being the right size, uh, unfortunately is is only five years old. So I wanted to minimize risk and only take one five year old horse across. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> How much did you pay for these horses? Uh, we paid twenty five hundred euros for the three, okay. which was uh, which was a good price, I think. Um, generally, a horse it depends on the region in Albania, the price that they go for. Um, oh, you're breaking up a little bit. Do you want to repeat that? Worse, but I think it was, it was oh, okay. Sorry, can you hear me? You you started to break up a little yeah. bit. Could you just repeat that last sentence? Oh, um, yes. Yeah, so we paid twenty five hundred for the three. Uh, Quindon's horse, I think, is probably the flashiest of the of the three. I couldn't tell you how much each one cost individually, but I think it was. We were happy with that price. And so you buy these horses. What was your plan for 
you know, you're not going to live in Albania forever. What was your plan for what you're going to do with these horses when you finish your trip? Did the guy, did you arrange with the guy to buy them back or how, how did that work? Mm, that's a super important question, actually, because it was the first thing we worried about when we decided to do a trip that wasn't a circle. Uh, was what are we going to do with these horses afterwards? And um, bef- it was actually, the first person I talked to was this NGO, uh, an American woman named Catherine Bunn, who runs an NGO in the north of Albania. Uh, I had spoken with her, and she had said, oh, well, we actually have a program where we're helping local entrepreneurs start sustainable, eco-friendly businesses that are tourist or tourism related. And I I know a guy that wants to start a horse tourism business. He's planned to pick up two horses this summer. Maybe your horses could finish with him. Uh, And so immediately I was like, yes, this is great because I'll know where they're going and I know they're not going to be doing, I'll know what they're doing. Right. Right. Um, And so while we were in the North, we met him, we taught a seminar uh, at the seminar, we basically talked about what Westerners expect uh, in a tourist situation to a handful of, of locals that are interested to, to guide people on horseback up there. Um, yes, yeah, so before we left, we knew where they were going, which was really a, a good feeling. And we had confidence about where they were going. Wow. And were they going to buy these horses from you or was it just a we'll donate yes. them? Okay. No, no, no. Uh, but we sold them at a, at a lower price than right like we sold them with all our gear and the and the horses okay wow so pretty good deal then so you didn't have to worry yeah that was nice otherwise i mean it was hard we'll get there but it was hard to leave them in the end knowing where i was leaving them i can't imagine just going to a market and saying goodbye right yeah <laughs> not knowing what what's going to happen next um mm. so i guess the the most difficult you know part finding the horses you, you've you now bought three horses. What what was the next step? And did it get easier from there? Or uh, It didn't actually get easier yet. Um, we tra- we had them transported up to the the, the horse tourism um, woman's farm. Can I, can I say who they are? Does that, yeah, is that sure. okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> um, her name is Christina Fidi, I think. And mm-hmm. they run caravan. They run caravan horse tours. Um, and they have like a modern barn. They have all their horses. They they breed themselves. It was awesome. And she said, you guys can keep, you can board the horses here um, while you prepare. And we have some old saddles and old equipment that we can sell you if they fit your horses. So that was awesome. We transported the horses to their place. Um, and we kept them separate from their horses. We started, all the horses in Albania are often trained to stay on like a long rope, like 10 meters or I don't know, 15 meters long. Um, and that was perfect for us because we didn't want to hobble. Uh, we didn't want to hobble at night. And so we were able just as soon as we got them to Christina's place to camp out with them at night. And they got used to before departure, they got used to staying close to us at night. You know, when we start moving in the tent in the morning, they knew breakfast was coming while we were at Christina's, we got them reshod. uh, and I made a quick visit to Greece to go to the tack shop to get the missing. We found saddles with her, but I had to go get missing equipment in Greece. So that was not easy nor expected. Okay. <laughs> so what what was the missing pieces you needed to get? Uh, cruppers, breastplates, um, a bridle. I brought. I had actually shipped a package over from France uh, with our pack saddle. I think I sent you a photo of it. It's a friend's Swiss military saddle. Um. And that was a funny experience as well, because customs in Albania, you have to pay a tax if you import anything more than 20 euros. Ah, okay. So, so you... like a DVD, you have to pay a tax. <laughs> okay, and is it a big amount or how It was. They wanted uh, my, my, it cost me 300 euros to ship this box of, I don't know, 30 kilos of, of pack saddle and some pads and some bits from France. And they wanted... 280 euros to get it out of customs wow okay uh but but we took we had luckily made a friend while we were visiting tirana who had a friend who was a state bodyguard and so he had the he had the badge and uh he went with us to customs so they couldn't kick us out because we were with a police police officer and uh and he spoke you know albanian and so he helped us negotiate it out we have a temporary visa for the saddle saddle could stay in Albania for 
90 days and then it has to be exported. It was just a really funny logistical escapade. That sounds funny. So did you kind of avoid some of the the tax fees then? We did, yeah. That was basically we applied for... We apply our saddle had had yeah we applied for a temporary visa for our saddle, which was approved, uh, and we sent a mysterious twenty three euro, I guess request fee, via bank transfer, and uh, we left with our saddle from customs. So that was that was funny, but we didn't. It wasn't really we didn't have all the equipment that went with it, so we had to adjust that for our pony. That was a funny adventure as well. Trying to we had the breastplate that was no problem. In Albania, they make kind of the back harness that goes on their saddles. So we bought one of those and adjusted that. And it, it really, we had a week and a half of preparation, and it, it took all of that to kind of get everything together, get everybody ready, everything so, fitting right. <laughs> so I can imagine it must be pretty stressful. And you know, some people listening, they might listen to your story, like, "What you had to." you know, get a visa for your back saddle, (laughs) you know, they might be listening to this like, oh my God, that is way too much work for me. You know, that sounds like, um, I don't know, it sounds like too much stress, but then, you know, there's other people like you or me, like I'm listening to that and I'm like, that's part of the fun, I think. Yes, it's stressful, but was, was it a little bit exciting? Like, you know, running around and getting all of the locals kind of on your side and helping you and... (laughs) Yeah, and I mean that's oh that's also part of the fun is you you meet people. While we were in Girocaster at Christina's farm, the the guys reshot our horses, but we had to go into town to get the shoes. And um, Johnny Quentin's horse, the the big one, has a big feet, presumably. It's, it, I still am laughing at it because you know we're used to big horses in the West, but um, so we, the shoes had to be brought special, and uh, it took us a, a, a little while to to find someone that could provide us with these shoes. And he said, "Okay, well I don't have them, but I'll have them tomorrow." And this is the third guy that sells horseshoes that finally you know had a solution to finding some. And so the next morning we go into town to get them, and I mean, it's not a small town. But we get, we get into town and about three or four people stop us. And say, hey, he has your shoes. Hey, he has your shoes. <laughs> and uh, so it was really funny to it, the, these types of little mishaps or, or problems actually really put you in contact with the people that you're there to meet. Right. So you yeah. have to just take it as it comes. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And I, and I've, I love um, countries like that where, you know, anything can be resolved because they know someone who knows someone. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's part of the adventure. So you spent this week kind of acclimatizing, you know, with the horses and getting the gear. Uh, what was your route idea? I know you said it was based off of this guy, but how did you find this route? And how did you, I don't know, manage the the beginning, the early stages? Hmm. The early stages of the well, to make the route in general, uh, I took his book. Because he didn't make a map, but that was fine. I took his book and I just highlighted every city that he mentioned, and yeah. I reconstructed the route that way, um, taking out the fact like there was a few parts where he's like, "This was really bad," so I was like, he will find a different way around this. Uh, <laughs> except, and then and then I traced it on like a, a a map that had the how do you say it in English that had the height of the mountains. Okay. The yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I traced it on that type of on an application on my phone. So we would know more or less the kilometers we had to do and the amount of climbing that there was. Because that's the hardest thing for the horses is is the ascents. And did uh, you see a... Because, you know, obviously with the horses, you want trails. You don't want to ride through the city so much. So, you mm-hmm. know, you're looking at the map, but did you see, like, I don't know, horse trails or, like, here's a little dirt track that you might be able to take? Uh, yeah, so in Albania, there it, the roads are still mostly four by four roads. Outside of like the big roads, uh, it, and if you're in the city, it's con- it's you know it's asphalt, but otherwise it's it's four by four roads. So okay. that was actually super helpful. Okay. Um, so your plan was to kind of stick to these little dirt roads and make your way through these different checkpoints. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Okay, and you say you're not the chaotic organizer. <laughs> I mean the 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 yeah. Afterwards, I did make a, bu- a, a handful of mistakes, more than a handful. Like the part where I I really sold it to Quentin as well. I was like, this part, it's afterwards. We've gone through the two national parks in the south where it's really mountains. 
And then we're just by this river for three days. You're going to love it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I had, you know, I had mapped that out. But uh, the river, by this river, is where they built the main road. So we can't take it because it's full of cars. And uh, there's not another road next to the river. <laughs> so we had, we, we get down towards the, this, ro- this, this river and we see that it's the highway. Oh no. And we're already on the horses. This was before we learned that we should really check the satellite during the rest days for the next leg. Uh, yeah, so that was that was not my finest moment. So, so was, what did you guys do? You turn around and go back a little bit or did you just No, we found uh on the other side but up. So like the river is down at I don't know 400 meters and uh where we ended up staying, we found there's an old military road that was on uh, up at 1200. But it meant that finally we had to ask to buy food from people's homes. But, I mean, it's not a big deal. Okay. So you just knocked on their doors and said, you know, do you have some noodles? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, actually in Albania, like I said, it's a really big culture of hospitality. So if we even had to ask, because a lot of people would come out and be like, what are you doing? Where are you going? That's so cool. Do you need some food? Um yeah, so if we had to ask, we'd be like, is there anywhere here we can buy food? And 100% of the time, the guy would be like, no, I'm calling my mom. <laughs> You're coming home for lunch. Do you want to stay a week? <laughs> Great. So you guys yeah. were, were not going hungry then? <laughs> no, no, no. And it's still very much in the mountains, uh, kind of a shepherd's culture. So everyone has their, their sheep and their goats. And often we were sent away and they all make their own homemade bread, which is delicious. And, uh, so often we were sent away with, with bags of food, uh, that we had to eat quickly. Otherwise it would spoil. (laughs) Wow. Okay. And so, see, what was your, when you first started, what was your plan for how you would get food or where you would sleep or. Um, I mean, we weren't actually so worried about us. We'd spent, you know, the, the, the winter and the spring on bicycle and we figured as long as there's humans, we can offer to to buy a, a loaf of bread or some cheese. So we weren't so worried about food for us, but we were worried about grain for the horses um, because they feed corn. They feed dried corn over there, uh, except if you're in the cities and then you can buy oats. Um, so that was tricky. That was every five days when we would stop, uh, we would buy food for the horses and put some of it on our horses. And sometimes we were able to send food ahead, like on a mini bus or have someone deliver it for us. Like, you know, three days down the road. Okay, that's pretty good. So you you kind of um, mentioned to them when you were shopping, like, hey, can you send this to this place? I'll, I'll be there in three days. Yeah, and we had, like, when we were, we had some friends come from Tirana to camp with us um, to participate in our journey. And uh, they brought us, you know, they brought grain, so we didn't have those days have to worry about it. Uh, and we were also very lucky in terms of the horse's, nutrition that we were still traveling i think from end of july and august it's really really dry but when we were traveling especially in the mountains you have really rich lovely grass up to your knees so the horses were not suffering (laughs) okay so up until now you make it sound pretty easy like oh you just contact this lady from an ngo and your horses are assorted (laughs) that was super lucky (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So tell us about, you know, you start this ride. What were some of the hardships, the difficulties, the challenges? And, you know, did you have a moment where you're like, oh, my God, what were we thinking? Um, I think it's the thing that's the hardest is the accumulation. Right. So there are little things that go wrong. We didn't have any big catastrophes. We really didn't. One day we lost a stirrup. In fact, we lost the stirrup, but we didn't realize it until we had already gone down the mountain. <laughs> and uh, we had to go find the stirrup. And that was really horrible. We we're both in agreement that was the worst day of the trip. But it, 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 that's really not a big deal. But the big deal is that even though we took regular breaks where we would rest for two days, you just get tired. I mean, you really, it's just little, it's just fatigue. And so there was one morning we woke up and we'd camped in a super awesome place. We had we had been walking along a canal, so we're all by ourselves. No cars go beside the water canal. And we went down like two kilometers to the river. There was a nice green space. We didn't even have to tie up the horses. There was water. It was awesome. We wake up in the morning and we're just grumpy. And so I think Quentin said to me, like, okay, you know what? When we get to Librasht, which is like two days away, 
I'm going to a hotel. You just sort out the horses and we're done with this trip. But it really didn't come from anywhere. And I said, okay, you know what? I'm done. I'm done right now. I'm staying at the bottom of this riverbed. <laughs> and, uh, and so we, I said it. I just crossed my arms and looked at him. And, uh, and we stared at each other really mad for about 10 seconds. And then we just laughed and we kept going. So, I mean, the, the hard part is the exhaustion. And it's, it's mental more than anything. So, so what is, what was your sort of daily routine? You know, did you have a certain, uh, let's wake up at this time and we're going to have lunch around this time and we're going to, you know, what was your <laughs> daily? I wish there was a routine. Um, the routine was when the birds start chirping, because uh, it also gets super light there really early. So the birds started about 4.30 and we would be up around 5.00. Uh, and as soon as the horses heard us moving, Johnny, his horse would start whinnying for breakfast. Um, so it takes a long time, I think in the mornings, especially to, to pack the pack horse. So it took us about two hours from waking up to, to getting in the saddle, to pack everything up, eat breakfast, make sure everybody's fed and happy and no bug bites or swelling, things like that. Um, and then we would ride for a few hours uh, we spent a lot of time walking as well because your knees get tired. Uh, it's more interesting. So we, we ride, we walk, we maybe stop for a coffee if we have the luck, the luck to be near a village or if somebody, a lot of times people will see you pass it. Oh, do you want to come in for a coffee? Sure. <laughs> um, we stop for lunch when we get hungry or when it gets really, if the hot days we would stop for lunch when we were by a water source so we could just kind of tuck under the shade, let everybody drink we could rest for an hour or two so it gets a little less hot then we keep going and uh yeah and what was roughly um the amount of miles or kilometers that you were covering in a day uh we aimed for 25 so some days we did less some days we did more the most we did in a day was 40 and that was way too much uh just in terms of we weren't trotting we were walking almost exclusively because the the pack equipment that we had was not really adapted for trotting or cantering um which is a actually a point of like a pain point that we want to resolve when we go to to central asia like how can we do this better so that we can go on a long gallop with the pack horse and you know is it because you had overpacked or was it just because there was so much stuff or um, it was because we weren't sure I mean, it was really our first time packing, right? So we weren't really sure the best way to do it. And we used our bicycle bags, uh, attached to the saddle, which worked. It was really cool. We had less than 500 grams of difference every day in the weight. Um, but yeah, it just, it, I don't know. It never really took, uh, when we, if we would go, there was one morning we, they, they left the horses escaped and, uh, they escaped. Griva took them on an adventure and, uh, they let, they went galloping back down the mountain, like two kilometers from where we'd, we'd, we'd camped the night before we caught them. And, uh, the pack pony, it really wasn't that unequal, but it was enough that it, it blocked us from, from, uh, from trotting a lot, I think. Okay. And what was some of the essential packing gears that you guys had? What, what was in that pack? Um, let's see. on the pony, we had, there's two or three days of grain, uh, which was the big weight. Uh, our tent, uh, sleeping bags and mattresses. And then there's one bag of electronics because we have, uh, we share a computer, we share a camera. Um, we have a book, a, a really good French author who wrote the uh, techniques of horse travel. Uh, and it's better than anything that's on the English market. It has really, really useful, like how to fix this, how to solve this, how to, uh, it, it, I, I don't know how to explain it other than like the Bible for horse travel. <laughs> uh, so we had some things like that. We had our change of clothes, I guess. We had what, wait, riding clothes. And, what and what was the name clothes. of that book? It's a, te in English, it's horse travel techniques. And in French. And, uh, Hold on, I can tell it to you. It's right next to me. Uh, Technique de voyage à cheval. And it's by Émile Brager. Okay. It's really super. So, it has it has uh, pictures, so if you don't speak French, honestly, you can get around it. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to add that to the show notes because it sounds amazing. Oh, yeah, it's, it's really... He tells you how to, like, make anything in an emergency. Perfect. 
Yeah. Okay, so then you had your riding glo- clothes and... Uh, yeah, we had our riding clothes and our city clothes, uh, rain gear. I think that's it. <laughs> we didn't have much else. Okay. Oh, and our cooking. We have, we have a little cooking, um, <coughs> cooking stove. Okay, and were you carrying much food on you, like for yourselves, or was it just let's let's knock on some doors? Uh, no, the food I had in the saddlebags on my horse, so okay. pretty small saddlebags, and just like the emergency food that we had was some pasta and like tinned sardines, and then <laughs> like like I said, people would come out with gifts. Like for a week and a half, we lugged around a liter of homemade like pear uh, jam. <laughs> I mean, they they cut, they really would, and you can't say no. And also, it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so those saddlebags were pretty much always full of funny gifts, but delicious. Okay, and so you said it took you a couple hours in the morning to pack. It takes you a couple hours. How much you know time do you think were you riding? Like how many hours did it take riding? And then when what time in the evening would you say your your day was done? Um, we would start looking for a good campsite. Well, I'll go to the first question. How many hours did we spend riding? We'd spend, in the morning, we would do about four hours alternating between riding and walking. So maybe, I don't know, two and a half, three hours riding, one hour walking. Um, and then in the afternoon, we tried to do less. Uh, and that's that's always the pain point, right? When you don't know where you're going to camp, uh, you start looking around five or six if you're if you feel like you've got a good chance of finding something quickly uh and sometimes you don't i think the latest we found a campsite was like 7 seven thirty. uh because we look for the problem is is if you camp the problem if you camp too close to a village the odds are that you will be invited home for dinner and you will not get to go to bed <laughs> at a reasonable hour mm-hmm. sometimes that was super great i mean you have to you know you, i can't i can't uh can only say good things about the hospitality. You know, it's, it's really, for them, it was super, a lot of places we went to, they tell us, you're the first tourist to ever come here. Like, okay. <laughs> so you, you really, you kind of have to play the role. And it's really lovely. You get to, to meet people and exchange with them. And it, it's super nice. But if you want to be quiet and go to sleep, you need to camp outside a village. And, you know, language-wise, did you have any struggles? Um... I think my rule when I don't speak the language is to kind of just say yes to everything because normally that means like they may be asking you if you want food or they may be asking <laughs> you if you want a shower. And so you say yes and they show you to the bathroom and give you a towel and you're like, all right. <laughs> okay, um, so you just need to word, learn the word yes in that language. And <laughs> Well, no, 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 because then, then they think that you understand everything and uh. they ask you a, a really simple question like how old are you? And you stand there with this stupid look on your face like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I mean, eventually the questions tend to repeat like, you know, uh, where are you guys from? Where are you going? What the, they're very, the culture is still very family oriented. So where are your parents? How many brothers and sisters do you have? And a lot of it is, you know, we show pictures on our phones. Great invention. Hmm. If there's really a language block, you can Google an, uh, an image, right? So you pull up an image of like, this is what I need urgently. Right. But no, normally pretty fine. Okay. And tell us, um, as I was sort of saying before, you know, some, so you went over some of the challenges, but what was some of the, the highlights or some of the moments where you were like, yes, this is why we're here. This is why we're doing this. Why isn't everyone doing this? You know, what was, what was some of the really awesome moments for you? Um, there was, I mean, the nature is is stupendous in Albania. It is pristine. The forests are beautiful. The biodiversity is. I it, I haven't seen so many insects or birds or, or wild animals anywhere. Um, and so that was really lovely. When you're up in the mountain villages, people still really live and function with the with the weather and with nature. Um, and so sometimes we were invited into people's homes where they, after communism, people had the, the, the right, I guess, the ability to, to leave the mountain villages. And that was sad in one sense and also beautiful in the, in the sense of the people who stayed really, really persevered in a place where it's difficult to, to live. 
and they would share, you know, the, the, the handful of photos that they have of them and their families. And they would tell us, you know, uh, what their grandfather built there and show us things uh, that we would have never seen if we had just gone on a tour, even if even if it was, you know, a, a hiking or the the horse was a really good way for us to a good opener into into people's homes and into people's lives and and to really meet Albania. Uh, so that was really amazing. So do you have any, uh, I don't know, advice or recommendations for somebody, not necessarily for Albania in general, but for, you know, doing something similar, like going to a country and just buying the horses and, and going on an adventure? Yeah, absolutely do it. Absolutely. Like the, first, the hardest thing is, is to say, okay, I'm going to do it and I, I don't know, buy your plane ticket or it, the rest of it can fall into place. You will find a solution for anything. I mean, you're not going to... The best example is like when I said I'm going to stay at the riverbed. For, I'm just done right here. You're not done right there. You're going to keep going. You're going to find a solution. So if I were to give like technical advice, the best advice I can tell you is to look on the satellite and really plan your route because that is, will take away so many frustrations. Um, but other than that, do it. Be flexible. Look for other solutions. Be ready to change your perspective. Be ready to open up, you know, I arrived and I was like, these wooden saddles are horrible. But, you know, they're not as horrible as that. Just be ready to, to learn, I guess. And would you, um, you know, you've, you've now had this experience, which is quite unique. Um, you know, not really anybody's going to Albania and just buying some horses and, and setting off. You know, there might be someone else interested in doing something similar, but maybe in a country where, you know, it hasn't really been done or, or something like that, you know, it's not just, uh, I don't know, some, some touristy kind of place, you know, it's sort of more remote. What, what do you think about, about that? You know, you, you just sort of decided, Hey, Albania looks nice. I'm going to do it. You had read this book. Um, but did you have these fears in the back of your mind? It hasn't really been done. Maybe it hasn't been done for a reason. So what, what was that? I don't know that feeling. Um, well, I, I, it also depends on the person cause I'm super stubborn. So I was like, it hasn't been done. Let's do it. <laughs> um, but, and, and we were definitely discouraged from doing it. We contacted the long riders guild, which is a, an association, I think based in England. Uh, and they, cause they, they were the one who, where I found the book online. I was like, oh, I'll buy this book. Uh, and they discouraged us. The author of the book told me it was going to be super hard. He's like, watch out for this, this, and this. Um, but I don't know. I think, you know, that there's not much left that we can explore in 2019. I mean, the hottest tourist destinations to go see nature are a lot of times already ruined because there's 2000 people every day that go to see it. So how, I don't know, for me, that's not so interesting. So Maybe I'm the the wrong person to to discourage people from doing this because that just it interests me more to go do something that hasn't been done. Yeah, yeah, no, I I definitely feel you there because um, I'm the same. If if somebody says that you know there's tourists going there, I'm like, nope, I don't I don't need to see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. I'll exactly. see the the pictures on Google like everyone else. <laughs> yeah. Um. So. How did it feel? You know when you made it to the end? Uh, there was a big moment of relief. Also, the, the last day that we rode, we were super tired. It ended really, it was a long day. Uh, we went through like this mountain pass. We were briefly in Montenegro. It was a really physically demanding day. Uh, but yeah, it, I think the moment it really felt like the end was when we said we went to visit the horses before we left for France. Uh, and we said, we said, thank you and goodbye. And that was sad. Even though I'm getting pictures of them every day, it was sad. I, you know, missed them. We made a, we made a little family and how do you thank them for that? So that was bittersweet, but yeah, it's cool, you know? <laughs> and how, you know, from, from Quentin's point of view, how did he feel? You know, he had at this point just done bicycling with you. How did he feel having had this horse adventure? Was he completely converted? Uh, or <laughs> Yeah, it, it was really actually, a, a, for me, a big bonus point or a big pleasure, I guess, out of this trip was to watch him become 
not just a good writer, but a very conscientious writer. Uh, he's really, really attentive to his horse. As soon as we were, you know, we were kind of training the new owners, you know, this is how you do this, do this. He was micromanaging more than me. Uh, so I think for him, it was, you know, it was also difficult for him to say goodbye to Johnny. Johnny was his first horse. How do you, you know? Right. But, uh, yeah, it's cool. I think also for him, it was a bit frustrating because us, we've grown up around horses, right? So we know the stupid things they do. They, they spook at stupid stuff. They, they do stupid stuff sometimes and you don't understand why. And so he definitely had never seen this part of the horse. And, uh, in the beginning, he's like, oh my God, he's so dumb. But then, about two or three weeks in, he really saw the humor of it, and uh, then it really became funny to watch. Watch, they kind of became our kids, and to watch what they were doing. And so, so I think he's converted. Yeah. <laughs> so, so do you have like a, a story or a, a moment where I don't know? It sort of really felt like you know, if not for horses, had we been on bicycles or on foot, you know, we never would have. I don't know gone up that trail or, or met this person or experienced that? Uh, every day. I mean, the roads were too bad to take bicycles. So every day we were great. And people asked us, why are you doing this on horses? But have you seen your roads? <laughs> uh, so that definitely. But also the, the horse is a, is something that people, even though there's not a big, you know, riding culture, nobody is competing or even really doing trail rides over there. It's something they're familiar with. So you you could much more quickly, I think, uh, relate to people and have a, a conversation starting point. I I wouldn't do it with bicycle. I would definitely do it with horses. I have no doubt in my mind. And and from a lady's perspective, you know, I, I know in a lot of these countries, just by being with a man, you know, there's a lot of, let's say, pressure taken off. But, you know, how did the men, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, is it like a male dominated country and were they kind of surprised to see a, a lady riding around or you know how, how was your take as a woman riding through Albania mm, I think uh, I think one thing that's important when you're a westerner coming into countries where it's male dominated and you're not used to that is not to try to assimilate but just play the tourist card uh, because the culture is super different. Never once did we see two women having a beer in a cafe, but I would go in and be like, I want an ice cold beer. And I think you really just have to own it. Uh, especially because the, the, these countries like Albania, for example, they, we really got the feeling they want to be a tourist destination, have people come. They love having people meeting people. Uh, so they need to see a girl in shorts. You know, they need to see, they need to see me going into the river in my bikini. It's important for, in my opinion, I don't know, I don't, maybe I'm a jerk and I'm pushing my culture on them, but it's also a hundred degrees and I'm going to wear shorts. Uh, so I don't know. I think if my perspective of it was, I'm just going to own it. I'm going to play the foreigner card and everybody was super nice and super respectful. I never had a, we never, I think had a moment that was like, Oh, that was, that was weird. And were you able to interact with some of the ladies or, um, did you have any, I don't know, other than just seeing them in the households or something? Did you have any oh, interactions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think one part of it as well is that because it's an ex-communist country there, it is still a male-dominated culture, and the women do a lot more than the men. Um, and I really think the future is is women there. I think uh, the, the people that stay in school more tend to be women. The people that tend to speak more languages tend to be the women. Uh, I really do think the future... It, it, there it is is the women um, so is there a but, local uh, is there a local person that you met that just really stands out in your in your mind that you had a, a fun experience with or oh uh, there, there's two grandmothers the grandmothers were the best because now you know that both of them were widows and they don't they don't care anymore they tell their sons what to do they tell everyone what to do they're so active there's one we met she was a hoot she was so fun. She's 74 years old, running around the house, so happy to have guests, telling everybody what to do, to giving us buckets and buckets of food and <laughs> pinching our cheeks and laughing. Uh, and, and she was also a really strong woman. When their family, when communism ended, everybody left for Tirana and she was with them. And uh, then her husband died and she said, I'm not dying in this stupid city. I'm going back to the home. <laughs> And so she left. She left everybody. She said, I'm going back to the family home. And slowly they all trickled back and now they live in the country again. <laughs> she sounds amazing. She was great. <laughs> yeah. um, so 
what's your did you leave your bicycle somewhere and you know you said you're back in france what's your plan to fly back to albania and pick up where you left off or uh we're not sure how we're getting back to albania um i think we might try to take a sailboat and then uh, our bicycles are with uh with Catherine, who runs the the ngo and we will spend the autumn getting down to turkey we're planning to spend the winter in turkey maybe where this is you know what we're planning loosely we haven't figured that out yet but we would like to do central asia next spring and summer so i guess we have to get there okay so are you are you kind of i don't know there's some bicyclists that are like you know oh if we put the uh, bikes in somebody's car and hitchhike to the next town then that doesn't count um and they have to bicycle the entire thing or are you guys a little bit more like you know if we get a ride and we go to some locals wedding party then that's an experience and we're not going to miss that yeah, we're absolutely not purists in that sense. We, uh, th- I think we broke that in uh, in Sicily when we realized that the Italians had decided to build along the beach, uh, the trail, the the train, li- the railroad, and the highway. And there's no other road option. We're like this is horrible. Mm-hmm. It is so not pleasant. Uh, and so I think if you can't take a mountain road, uh, there's no shame. <laughs> There's absolutely no shame in hitchhiking. If the road is horrible and you're not having fun or it's dangerous, why are you doing it? Yeah. And and did you kind of have that in the back of your mind with the horses as well? Like, well, if at some point it's just highway, we could load them up in a truck and skip this bit. We did. We actually, there was uh, the city of Kukes is kind of the, the portal to the north of Albania. Uh, and there are no, it's all asphalt because the... It's really, really rugged terrain. It's like super brushy. And we thought about it with, you know, okay, are we going to get a truck to take us across the bridge at Kukas and then maybe 20 kilometers up into the country? Um, yeah, we were, we were, we were, if it was dangerous and if there had been a lot of uh, traffic, we would have done it. We're not going to put our horses in danger. Okay. But you guys ended up riding through and it was fine. We ended up walking, but. Okay. Yeah. You know, just a, I don't think it's good for there. I, I'm a big believer of protect the tendons. So mm. didn't want to ride too much on the asphalt. No, yeah, definitely. I, I agree with you. Um, I was looking at riding around the horses here in England, and I'm like, well, you know, it's like 90% road. Mm. <laughs> and, yeah, it's small roads where the BMWs can zip around the corners really fast. And, oh, yeah. there's a horse. Wow. Yeah, so I was like, well, you know, do I really want to ride around in some of these places? I think it's nicer to just go ride around in the nice places in Dartmoor or something. <laughs> Yeah, Um, absolutely. Yeah, so I think that's a good message for people, you know. It doesn't have to be... The challenge is what you make it, you know. You invent your own rules, sort of. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no one saying, like, oh, actually, you didn't do the horse trek across Albania because you walked every hour. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. Okay. (laughs) So so roughly how long did this take you, start to finish, and um, how many miles did you you cover, do you think? Uh, so I can tell you the miles exactly, well, the kilometers, because I, I tracked it with a, a Garmin the whole trek, and okay. I'm working on putting a nice map together uh, that anyone can have. I, like, please take it and use it and go do your own thing in Albania. So we did 757 kilometers. Uh, that takes out a few kilometers where we got lost. <laughs> um, and it took us 42 days. But it was only 31 days of trekking because every, you know, every week we took days off. Okay. And do you have any things, I know you did mention some stuff like that you might have done differently or something, but, you know, for your next trip, is there like one really big takeaway that you're like, okay, next time we're not going to do whatever? Um, I think there's two and they're things we're discussing right now. Well, one of them we know will change differently, which is to look more the route. Uh, I guess on the step, maybe it'll be easier, but uh, because we were in the mountains so much, I, it's really important to plan your route, and I have, we have to plan the route better so there's less roads. Um, and the second thing is that question of the pack horse, how are we going to do better to go faster? And was the pack horse, you said that they were used to being on this long line, was the pack horse on a line, or did he? was he free at some point, or...? Uh, most of the time I had him on a short line uh, behind me, like he would do a polo pony, like three meter line. Because uh, he he's actually more reactive if he just stuck his head in Griva's tail and just trucked along. Then if you gave him a long line, he would see like a particularly appeasing 
bit of grass and he would like jerk it and try to munch. And were you holding yeah. him or was he kind of tied to your horse? Or? Uh, so, yes, I put it, uh, if you ride in an English saddle, actually the safest way to pack without having him in your hand is to take the rope. You have him on your right side and you have the rope come over your right leg and you just put it under your left leg. Uh, so if he panics, you can, the rope will come undone, but the weight of your leg gives enough, uh, tension that he'll, he knows he's tied. Hmm. Yeah. Cause I didn't want to tie. Yeah. So I hate that we have to wrap up. Um, hmm. do we have, you know, where can people follow your adventures and what's the best place to, to spy on you basically? <laughs> uh, probably our Instagram. We have a blog, but we're notoriously bad about keeping it very up to date um but so our instagram is uh how do i say it with an in- american accent it's, <laughs> it's uh ancel it's e-n-s-e-l-l-e dot voyage uh voyage and uh it means in the saddle in french which is kind of our project in the bike saddle in the horse saddle okay in the so saddle. so i i do have <laughs> just just one more question before we we go forever um, how are you funding this adventure? Uh, it's a good question. Um, part of it is, like I mentioned earlier, our, our startup didn't get second round of funding. So there was a, a kind of small compensation package when we all got laid off. Uh, part of it was for a year before we left, we put away 700 euros a month. Uh, and you also have to realize when you're traveling on bicycle and horseback, you're not spending that much money. I mean, we are living on easily, uh, comfortably, like we're not starving or not have, we're having ice cream when we want to have ice cream, right? Uh, we are living on 500 euros a month. For the two of you. Yeah. That's pretty we good. Don't have ho- yeah, we don't have hotel bills. We don't eat in restaurants that much. You know. It's, and and it, are you able to camp everywhere or, you know, do you have to get uh, hotels sometimes? It's nice to get hotels sometimes uh, because you need to wash clothes. And it's nice also to just like hide from the world a little bit. Even in your tent, you're still, you know, a little bit more exposed than you would be in an apartment. Um, But for that, for example, we used, uh, we built up when we lived in Paris, we had, uh, there's a network called Home Exchange and people come and they pay with points instead of Airbnb with money, it's with points. And you use these points somewhere else. So whenever in Italy we needed to stay somewhere, we just used our points. Okay. Well, so you got yeah. this figured out. <laughs> it, it, there's a lot of ways. Like, if you're interested to to travel comfortably but not expensive, you totally can. Uh, I think that's one to... of the biggest um, obstacles that people um, have when they think, "Oh, I would love to travel, but I just can't afford it." So, mm. 500 euros a month for two people—that's that's pretty affordable, I think. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and there's things you just cut out. Like we cut out buying wine and cheese uh, which is a really weird french thing that i I, we cut out but you really don't realize how much you it you know having a beer at the end of the day you spend three or four euros well three or four euros it's Mm. lunch in a grocery like you go buy some vegetables and there you go cool so one last time what's your instagram name it's uh ancel uh dot voyage uh, dot voyage Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining for joining me today. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you. I, I'm definitely gonna keep spying on you and your adventures. Absolutely, I would love for us to be able to to meet up while we're in Central Asia. You oh yeah, come, uh, I, I only come need, ride with us. Yeah, I, I just need 24 hours notice. So <laughs> excellent. <laughs> I'm excellent. on my way. <laughs> you have been listening to the Equestrian Adventuresses podcast. Please subscribe to our channel and check out our website equestrianadventuresses.com for links to the show notes. Leave us a review and consider becoming a premium member for bonus episodes and footage. More information can be found on our website. Until next time, adventuresses, happy trails. Happy trails.